Hi guys, in my last few videos I've put together this homebrew floppy disk controller circuit and in the very last video I was testing this with an Arduino to check it was reading the data off the floppy drive correctly and that all went pretty well. What I'd like to do today is start to hook it up to a 6502. So let's have a look at what's involved. The way I see it, the system as a whole uh, is kind of split into separate components here. You've got the floppy disk drive, which is obviously an external unit, we're not going to tamper inside that. Then that's connected pretty directly to the floppy disk controller circuit, which is vaguely what I put together over the past few videos. Um, and previously that was connected directly to an Arduino. Now the Arduino has GPIO pins, which makes it very easy to connect it to this kind of circuit. The 6502 doesn't have that, so we're going to need some CPU interface in the middle. And in fact, the way I hooked the Arduino up wasn't really ideal for a sort of long-term use anyway. That was mostly just for testing. So there's a bit more we can do in this interface to make it a bit more comfortable from the CPU's perspective. So I sketched out this diagram to show the kind of external signals the CPU interface needs to kind of provide and based on this we can start to fill in the blanks. Along the bottom I've got the interface to the CPU itself. Uh, there's a chip select which uh, lets the CPU say whether it wants to talk to the floppy disk controller at the moment. There's a read-write signal which just connects directly to the CPU's read-write and that allows the CPU to send data or receive data from the FDC. Uh, there's a register select line here. In fact, we might need multiple lines there. I'm not quite sure how many registers we'll have, but there may be a few lines there which lets the CPU choose between several different kinds of interaction with the floppy disk controller. And then there's these eight data lines which just connect to the CPU's data bus. Down the left hand side, I've put the signals which come from the floppy disk controller to the CPU interface. So these are sort of outputs of the floppy disk controller or inputs to the CPU. The top three are actually connected directly to the floppy disk drive. Uh, that's why they have these pull-up resistors because the interface to the floppy disk drive uh, says that the floppy disk drive will pull these signals to ground when it wants to assert them and it will let them float when it doesn't. So we need to pull them up to uh, 5 volts here so that we can tell the difference between the two states. The top one is the track zero signal, which uh, goes to ground when the floppy disk head is currently on the outermost track of the disk. The second signal down is write protect. That's not actually very interesting for me. I'm not sure why I put it on the diagram, but never mind. Um, that tells us whether the, the disk is write protected. The next one down is the index line. This, uh, this goes to ground for a short period of time, uh, once per revolution of the disk. So the disk normally rev revolves at 300 RPM. Uh, that's five times per second. So when the disk is properly spinning, we should see five ticks on that index pulse every second. The remaining signals go actually to the floppy disk controller rather than the floppy disk drive. Uh, byte is a signal that I generate from the controller once per byte that's read from the disk, and it indicates that the floppy disk controller's outputs are in a good state for the, for the, for the value of the byte to be read from them. The signal below it is AM, which uh, stands for address mark. So along the track, I, I think I explained this in, a, in an earlier video, but the track basically consists of a series of fields, and each field is prefixed by one of these address marks. Finally, at the bottom, I've got the uh, read data lines coming from the floppy disk controller, and there are actually 16 bits here, uh, 8 bits of data and 8 bits of clock, because that's how the FM signal is, uh, is, is constructed. On the right hand side, uh, these are the outputs from the CPU to the floppy disk controller, or in fact, these are actually all outputs straight to the floppy disk drive itself. Um, and that's why they have these MOSFETs on them. So once again, the interface between the host and the disk drive is such that the sender of a signal needs to either pull that signal to ground or let it float. And the receiver needs to have a pull-up resistor to whatever voltage it wants. I think it's usually five volts. Um, and typically for five and a quarter inch disk drives, that pull-up resistor is only 150 ohms. And that means that when we're pulling the signal to ground and the floppy disk drive has got a 150 ohm resistor to the 5 volt line, uh, there's going to be about 40, 30, 30 or 40 milliamps of current flowing down that wire. And a lot of the 74 series chips that I'm using aren't really designed to sync that amount of current, so I can't really connect them directly to the floppy disk drive, or I probably could, but I probably shouldn't. So what I've, what I've drawn here is uh, a MOSFET on each line, so the 74 series logic is going to set the gate of the MOSFET either high or low, and if the gate is high, then the MOSFET would essentially short the data line to the drive to ground, um, and the MOSFETs I'm using uh, should be able to deal with the 40 milliamp current. So the signals that I've drawn on here are, first of all, direction, and this controls which direction the heads will step in if we ask them to step. 
um, the step signal which tells the heads we want it to step one track either up or down depending on the state of the direction line. Uh, SS1 means side select one. That causes the drive to use the heads on the upper surface of the disc instead of the heads on the lower surface, assuming it's a double-sided drive. And then I have cell 0 and load, which I've connected together here. So cell 0 selects drive 0, and load enables the motors in the drives and makes them, makes them spin their discs. So I've joined them together because I basically want the motors to spin any time I select the drive. So what I want to start with, rather than uh, hooking up the 6502 to the read data like I did for the Arduino, I think I'm going to start by hooking it up to m some of these signals that goes directly to the floppy disk drive, like the um, stepping signals for seeking tracks and things like that, and we'll see if we can get the 6502 to control that first. So let's think about a circuit to do that. Now one option here is to use a 6522. Um, that has quite a lot of uh, data outputs and it kind of partly solves the issue of the 6502 not having any GPIO, because that's essentially what it provides. Um, I've chosen not to do that here. I prefer to do it from first principles, because I guess what I'm sort of doing is building roughly what's inside a proper monolithic floppy disk controller IC, um, and I think doing it from the sort of register level is a little bit closer to what would actually be inside the chip and it gives me an interface that's a little bit closer maybe also to the way those chips worked. So let's look at the outputs first. For example, uh, the selection, the, 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 the head loading thing which starts the motors and the stepping and direction lines uh, which are going through those MOSFETs. So I need to send signals to those MOSFETs and they're going to be active high. Um, there's a couple of different ways I could do this. Um, it strikes me that some of these signals are going to stay on for quite a long time once they're enabled. For example, once I select the drive, it's going to stay selected for quite a long time. So it's possible that using an addressable latch here, like a 74HC259, would be sensible, because that would allow the CPU to individually control the state of each of these data lines. The other main option is to use uh, like an 8-bit D flip-flop, like a 74HC374, uh, or maybe a 273. I think the 273 is appealing because it has a master reset option on it, um, which means that I can ensure on power on that all of these signals are off. Um, so that's, that might be what I'll go for. The slight disadvantage of using a 8-bit D flip-flop is that whenever the CPU writes some data to this, it's going to have to actually write all of the bits at once. So for example, when I've enabled the drive, like turned on the motors and stuff like that, if I then want to step the heads, when I do so, I need to also make sure I'm leaving that bit set for keeping the drive motors running, otherwise they'll turn off. And the 74HC273 or 374, or whatever, all of those chips are quite easy to interface to the 6502 as well. A little bit easier than the addressable latches, and that's due to the way the 6502 presents data to be written. Uh, because, it, because it presents it at the trailing edge of the clock signal, it makes it a little bit difficult to get the addressable latch to latch that data at the right time. It's much easier with a flip-flop, which is triggered by the trailing edge of that clock and samples the data from the CPU at exactly the right time. So that's mostly going to handle the, the right signals that kind of go out to the drive. Um, obviously the other side of the um, 74HC273 is going to be connected to the CPU's data bus. I might buffer that as well just to kind of reduce load on that bus, but we'll see about that. For the incoming data here, it's going to have to be also connected to the CPU data bus, but it needs to only drive it when the CPU is actively reading from from this device. So uh, this is going to have to have tri-state outputs of some kind. There are two main options here. Again, I could use some form of D flip-flop, uh, like a register sort of thing. Another option is to use a transceiver rather than a flip-flop. So the transceiver won't remember the states of its inputs internally, uh, but it will optionally pass them through or not. It, it sort of has tri-state outputs. And I can connect the different pins on the transceiver to different signals from the floppy disk drive with the pull-up resistors and then when I enable the output enable on the transceiver it will write to the CPU's data bus whatever whatever values those things have so for example I've got track 0, write protect index here and then my byte and address mark signals and things like that. So now I have these two components um, I need to enable one or the other one depending upon whether the CPU is reading or writing data and the way I'm going to do this is might seem a bit strange at first because it's a little bit overkill, but I'm going to use a 74HC138 uh, eight-way decoder for this. 
I'm going to wire the read-write from the CPU into pin A2 of the 138. And what this will mean is the 138 will activate one of the first four outputs when the CPU is trying to write data, and it will activate one of its last four outputs when the CPU is trying to read data. So if I connect A0 and A1 to ground for now, then when it's active, the 74HC138 will either activate its 0 output or its 4 output. So when the CPU is writing, it will out activate output 0, and when it is reading, it will activate output 4. And these are active low, so uh, when, when it's not active or when something else is happening, these will be high, but when, 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 when the CPU is doing the appropriate action, the, the relevant line will go low. And I can connect these directly to the output enable signal on the uh, 245 transceiver, uh, and I can also connect it to the clock signal on the uh, 74HC273D flip-flop, so that the rising edge, i.e. the trailing edge of the active period, uh, will cause the 273 to uh, latch in the data it can currently see on the data bus. The 74HC138 also has three enable pins, which, which allows us to do some address decoding at this point as well, potentially. So rather than having a chip select going straight in here, I could actually just abuse some of these signals to do that. And in fact, what I might do, I think, is use... The, I think I, I think the uh, Garth Wilson stroke Benita uh, 6502 design already has a kind of nandy thing between address 14 and the inverted address 15. Uh, so I could feed that into one of the active low enable lines on the 138. And if I feed address 13 into the other one, then I think this will be active for the 4,000 to 6,000 range of addresses in hex for the 6502, uh, which is otherwise unused in, in, in my current system. The third enable pin I'm going to connect to the CPU clock Phi 2. And the reason for that is I only want the ICs I've connected up here to be active when Phi 2 is high. It's very important with the 6502, particularly for write operations or anything with side effects, that you don't make any important decisions based on what the 6502 is saying outside the period when Phi 2 is high. So when Phi 2 is low, I want all of the output pins of the 74HC138 to just stay high and for nothing to happen in the circuit. Um, and then when, when Phi 2 goes high, then, then one of them can go low and we can, we can do the appropriate operation at that stage. So for now, let's go and set up the circuit with what we've discussed so far so that the 6502s can be able to have basic control over the floppy disk drive. Okay, so I've had a rummage around my spare parts to see what I can find, and I've located uh, 74 AHCT138. That's the eight-way decoder we're going to be using. Um, so that's the one which takes uh, various address uh, selections from the CPU and decides which of the other chips to activate on the on the floppy disk controller. This one over here is a 74HCT273, and that's going to be the 8-bit D flip-flop with master reset that we're going to be using uh, to drive the outputs that go to the floppy disk drive. And this one over here is a 74HC243, I think. Uh, that's a 4-bit bus transceiver. I wanted to use a 245 for this, uh, which is an 8-bit transceiver, but I couldn't find one. I'm going to use the 4-bit one anyway, because I only need 4 bits at the moment. Um, probably at a later date I'll swap that out for a 245 when I find one, or buy one, or something like that. I'll also be using these uh, 2N7000 MOSFETs uh, for, the, uh, for the output drivers to the floppy disk drive. Um, I checked the data sheet on these. They are capable of the current load that I need, and I think uh, we might. Yeah, I, I, I think I think they're going to be fine. I looked it up. The the the, the general resistance with a with a five volt uh, gate to source voltage is going to be five ohms. So these are going to present about five ohms to the uh, current coming through from the floppy disk drive. Um, I, I did I did I did a wattage calculation on that as well because these things don't have heat sinks and so on. Um, I think they're going to be fine though. There's not going to be much power dissipated across the MOSFETs, so they should be good. Uh, what else? So I also rummaged around and dug up quite a lot of kind of little bits of wire that I've used in the past on other projects um, and, and other spare parts. So I'll see what I can recycle from other projects when, when doing this. I don't like throwing all this stuff away. Um, so yeah, it's nice to it's nice to keep hold of it and then see whether there's a use for it in future. 
But for now, let's uh, look at how we can lay this out on the breadboard. Is the focus okay? I'm having some trouble with my camera at the moment. Um, anyway, I'm going to put the decoder um, at the far end of the breadboard over there. And like I said before, this is mostly going to have... Uh, oops, come on, in you go. That's mostly going to have address lines from the CPU coming into it. Um, a couple of the ones on the bottom here are going to be selecting which of the registers on the card the CPU is accessing at any point in time. The CPU clock's also going to go into that, as we said before. Um, and then a couple of the pins are also uh, going to be connected to high bits on the CPU address bus so that this device is enabled at the appropriate time. Uh, across the top of the chip, and I think one of the pins on the bottom as well, are the outputs that it's going to use to then drive other ICs that I put along here and activate them appropriately based on what the CPU is asking for. Then I've got the uh, 7.4 HCT273, yeah, the D flip flop thing. I'm actually just going to use this. Yeah, I'm not going to put this in. What I want to do is have a bit of space here for future expansion for adding the circuit to read data from the floppy disk drive. So I'm going to leave space enough space for two of these just to make sure we've got uh, a, a bit of a gap there. Um, and then I'm going to put the 74HC243 bus transceiver in next. So that is going to go in there, like that, and then the the two seven three will go after that, and the reason I've put the two seven three at this end of the board is because it's got it's going to have to drive the MOSFETs, and I'm going to use this part of the board for the MOSFETs. Um, they need three pins each, so that's plenty of space. Actually, the two four three bus transceiver is only four bits, and if I'm going to later replace that with the two four five, those ones are a bit bigger, so. Let's leave an extra three pins of space so that I'll be able to make that replacement later on. Put the 273 in here. Okay, these things all need power and ground. So let's put those on. Black and red wires seem to be, seem to be the ones I'm, I'm most missing here, so I'll have to cut some new ones. So now let's put the MOSFETs in, which are going to drive the outputs to the floppy drive. So these are 2N7000 MOSFETs, and I've pre-bent the source pins so that they can uh, reach through to the ground rail on the breadboard. The gate and drain will just go to the regular kind of connections on the breadboard there. So there are five of them with their source pins connected to ground and the gate and drain pins alternate along the breadboard. So now let's look at the transceiver. It has four data pins on the bottom which are going to connect to the CPU data bus and four on the top which are going to connect to the floppy drive and these are going to be inputs uh, from the floppy drive. So I want to set the transceiver's output enable for its top half to be off and for the top half that's an active high signal. So we're going to tie that to ground. And that just ensures that these four pins all behave as inputs all of the time. Then for the bottom half, uh, the output enable is active low. And we're going to hook that across to the uh, one of the outputs on the decoder. I think it's output four we're going to need. So let's do that. That's not one, two, three, four. So output four goes to pin one on the transceiver. So now these four transceiver pins will copy the state of these four input pins when the decoder activates the transceiver. So let's also connect output zero of the decoder to the clock pin on the 8-bit D flip-flop. And this means that when the CPU writes to the register, the decoder will drive this signal low and then high again at the end of the CPU clock cycle. And that rising edge causes the D flip-flop to latch in the data from the CPU's data bus and pass that through to its output pins. 
So this is a fairly typical way to hook up a D flip-flop as an output register in this kind of 6502 circuit. So the D flip-flop also has a master reset pin. I'm not going to connect that to anything right now, but later I'll, I'll probably connect that to the reset signal for the, for the circuit as a whole. And, that, and that'll just ensure that these uh, outputs all get cleared to the off state when the computer resets. Now, the input pins on the transceiver need pull-up resistors because they're going to be connected to uh, outputs from the floppy drive, and that's just the way the floppy disk interface works. I think you're supposed to use 150 ohms for this. Um, I'm using a 470 ohm to limit the current a little bit more, and I think it's fine to use larger values. I'm pretty sure that the 3.5 inch disk drives actually use like 1K or something, so it should be fine. Now the outputs from the 8-bit D flip-flop register need to be connected through to the MOSFET gates uh, so that it can control those. Um, before I do that though, I'm going to connect the gates together on the first two MOSFETs, and that's because I want to drive these together. So whenever I turn one of them on, I want the other one on as well. Um, so they're just going to be connected to one bit of data from the CPU. So yeah, let's let's join those gates together. And these will be the drive zero select and motor on signals uh, to the floppy drive. So now we can go ahead and connect all of the MOSFET gates to the D flip-flop outputs, um, which is fairly straightforward. Although the outputs of the D flip-flop are in a funny arrangement here. It's just how these uh, ICs are arranged. The inputs and outputs are kind of interspersed around the chip in a, in a, in a weird sort of repeating pattern. It's a bit confusing at first, but you kind of get used to that in the end. Actually, I'm going to move all these to the top row of the breadboard just to get them out of the way a bit um, when I connect the inputs up in a minute. That's better. So the MOSFET drains will be pulled to ground when the CPU writes ones into the corresponding bits on the D flip-flop register there. And the transceiver can optionally pass its inputs through to the CPU data bus as well. So both these devices go onto the data bus. And because they're both on the data bus, we can join the relevant pins just straight together here now. Uh, the transceiver outputs and the flip-flop inputs. And these two ICs never talk directly to each other. There's no real con correspondence between the meanings of these signals. It's just that they're both on the CPU data bus. They're activated separately, one at a time. Uh, but because they're both on the CPU data bus, we can just connect all of that together already. And we need to connect the unused input pins on the D flip-flop to ground, because it's a CMOS chip, you're not supposed to let them float. It can cause overheating and other weird problems. So yeah, it's worth connecting them all to ground, or, or at least to some constant level. But I think that's about it uh, in terms of things that need to go on the breadboard. It needs power, um, we need to connect the, p connect the ground and power rails on the top and bottom together and stuff like that. Um, obviously it needs to be connected to the floppy drive, and there's a lot of places in this circuit that now need to be connected through to the computer, to the CPU and things like that. But now let's go and write the code that will drive this, and we can come back to the hardware later and hook it all up to the computer properly. So I don't want to dwell too much on the code, um, but what I've got here is a copy of a test program that I use for my video circuit, um, and I'm just sort of taking bits out of it to make it uh, just do what we need for the floppy disk. So I think to start with, uh, we don't really need the FAT32 and SD libraries. Uh, let's get rid of all this stuff as well. Um, Initialize the VIAs, initialize the LCD printer string, initialize the video output system. I'm going to print something there. Looks like a letter A. Oh, that's going to the LCD. And right, then we're going to print hello world at the top of the screen. Um, we can get rid of most of the rest of this, I think. None of this is really needed. And I'll replace all of this with code I actually want to run to drive the floppy disk system. Um, so, what should we do? So I'm going to just move to a new line. Um, and I'm going to make a function to show 
the floppy disk status. And what that function is going to do is read from that uh, the read-only register on the floppy disk controller and print out like which of the signals are active, like the track zero and the index signal in particular, I think, are the interesting ones here. So I'll get that to print those. Um, we can wait for a button then. After waiting for the button then, let's um, let's make it do some stepping. So I'm going to step in four tracks. I'll write that step function in a minute, and I'll make that step function also do a little delay, like for a V-sync or something, so it'll do that at a reasonable rate. Um, then we can show the status and wait for a button again. Um, then let's do let's make another routine that will step us to track zero. So this one's going to work by stepping outwards until the track zero signal is set. So that, that that that'll be an interesting one. And then yeah, we can show the status and wait for a button again at the end of that. Then then I'll just do lots more stepping. So I'm going to make a loop, I think, and we're going to step in a track. Um, and then we can read the current track. Oops. I'll make the track stepping routines keep track of which track we're on. Um, so we can read the current track and compare it against 39, which is the last track on a 40 track disc. I think the drive I'm using is an 80 track drive, but I'll, I'll use 39 just to be safe so we don't go too far. And if it was less than 39, then we can uh, loop again. So that should now after doing the four track step and then a seek to track zero, it will do 40 single track steps, or th sorry, 39 single track steps outwards. Then let's show the status and wait for a button again. Yeah, let's go back to track zero again after all of that. So I'm just gonna copy that code from above. So we're gonna go back to track zero, show the status and wait for a button again. Um, and then I'm going to make another loop. It's very much like the first loop. I'm going to do it more slowly this time so it sounds a bit different. Um, so this will sound a little bit more like it's actually loading data from the disk. And if you've got to this point in the video, you've probably already heard this one because I'm probably going to use it uh, for the intermission screens. I'm going to wait for 30 V-Syncs. Oops. So my video circuit's running at 60 hertz, so that's half a second. So we should be tracking one step. So we should be stepping one track every half a second there. And this is the same code as above, really. And when that's done, we'll go back to track zero. And then I think we can loop because loop one was another stepping in loop. So after that point, it can just kind of go round and round those loops. Oh, one thing I didn't do here was actually turn the drive on. I want the motor on when I do all of this. So after we, after we show the states and do the button, let's just do, uh, how should I turn the drive on? I'm going to make a constant for the, the control bit that turns the turns the motor on. Um, yeah, I'm going to store that in the FTC CTL. So we're going to end up with constants like um, FTC CTL motor on. That 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 can be one probably. So I can make that bit one of the whole uh, register that we've hooked up. Um, and this FDC CTL is going to be 4,000, I think, with the way I did the address decoding. Um, what were the other signals? I need, I need a direction signal. Uh, a step signal. I think there was a fourth one I had hooked up, wasn't there? The side select. probably won't be using that one. I'll have to make sure I, I wire these into the correct bits of the data bus when I, when I get around to doing that. Oh, also there's the status register as well, so... Oh, 
there's this uh, track zero signal from the disk drive wasn't there. I'm just going to put T0 for that, keep it a bit shorter. Um, what, are, what else did I have coming from the disk drive? Write protect. Um, had one more, didn't I? Index. Okay, so there's uh, three signals coming from the floppy disk drive as well. And FTC status is also 4000. Because as far as the CPU is concerned, both these registers are mapped at the same address. The distinction is made by the hardware based on whether we're reading or writing. So that's good for general control variables for the floppy disk system. I'll just put them up there for now. Uh, what else? So now we've made it so we push the button, it turns the motor on and immediately steps in. Let's actually make it wait for the button in between um, just so that we can do those things separately. Um, but yeah, I think that's good. So now we need, need to write some of these routines. So we need a routine for stepping in. This is going to load uh, FDC CTL uh, motor on, ORD with FDC CTL um, direction. I think we want the direction set for this one. And then step as well. Actually, no, we, do we want step? Yeah, we want step. So the step signal on the floppy disk drive uh, the, the, the actual stepping happens at the end of the signal, so what I'm going to do here is activate the step signal with the direction bit set here. Um, I'm going to store that in the, in, the, in the floppy disk control register, and I don't think I need to hold that state for very long, so I can immediately do the same thing uh, without, without the step bit set and store that. So I think that will step one track. Uh, I think I said I was going to make this also do a slight delay, so we're going to do a wait vsync at this point. And then come back. So we can also do FTC step out, which is the same code but with the direction not set. I have to check I'm doing that the right way, otherwise, uh, otherwise it won't work. Stuff won't work properly. Then I had FTC seek track zero. Oh yeah, that's an interesting one. When we step in, I want to also ink ZP FTC track, and when we step out, I want to deck ZP FTC track. Should just do that at the end. Do it after the V-Sync. That's that's good. Let's do all of those after the V-Syncs. And the reason for that is I'd like to then just check the FDC status signal. And I'm going to compare that with the, I'm going to read the T0 bit off that. Now this signal is going to be is going to be low when the disk head is on track zero. So if this is zero, then I want to set the ZP FTC track variable to zero, otherwise I'll leave it alone. So if that's equal to zero, FTC set track zero. I'm going to make a separate routine for that. And that goes down here. FTC set track zero just stores zero in that track register, or sorry, track variable. So I think that's a decent step in and step out routine, uh, including tracking which uh, track we think the floppy disk drives on. That can get out of sync, um, but to get it back in sync, whenever we get to track zero, uh, it's going to actually detect that through the, um, through the T0 signal from the floppy disk drive and set it to zero in that case. So that should be good. Uh, what else did we have? We had a seek track zero routine. Oh, I started writing that down here. Um, 
for that what we want to do I think what I'm going to do here is I'm not going to rely on that track variable I'm going to load FTC status and with FTC status t0 um, I'm going to back so branch of equal to seek track zero done because if if that bit is set then the floppy disk drive is saying we're already on track zero so we don't need to do anything otherwise we're going to JSR to FDC step out and jump to FDC seek track zero so basically if we're not on track zero already we're going to keep stepping out until we are on track zero And then we need, oops. And then we need this label for it to jump to from here. If it reached track zero, we're just going to return there. So I think that's most of the seeking things done. Was there anything else I did up here that needs to be implemented? Show sure, FDC status. Okay. I think that's all. All the other things here are things I already have. So sure FDC status uh, is going to we're going to load from the FTC status byte and then we're just going to take it bit by bit. Um, so we're going to raw the accumulator. I think it's just raw in this compiler in this in this assembler. Um, if the carry is set, let's say if the carry is clear, we're going to. Um, what was in the bottom bit? What, what, order, what order did I put the bits in? Um, where were they? Right at the top. So we've got T0, write protect, and then index. Okay, so after the first raw, um, if the carry is set now if the carry is clear then uh, then it's not track zero if it is track zero then I'm going to go to this vid print string in routine and tell it to print t0 under space um, So that's the that, that that's the general structure here. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to push a and pull a because I think vid print string is probably going to corrupt a. So basically, what we're doing is we're loading the status byte from the status register of the floppy disk controller. We're rotating it so the bottom bit goes into the carry. If that carry is clear, then we don't do this next bit of code. But if the carry was set, then it means that we are on track zero. Actually, yep, I got that backwards. That should be BCS. So if the if the carry was set, then that bit was set, and that means we're not on track zero. So we don't print T zero. If that bit was clear, then we are on track zero. So the, so we push the accumulator just so we don't lose it. Uh, print this string T zero, and then we pull the accumulator back again, and then we can carry on. And this piece of code I can now repeat for uh, the other signals. So uh, it was write protect and index. Not really expecting these to show up, to be honest, because I'm, o I'm only calling this function very sporadically, and the, the, the chances of me calling it during an index hold are very low. So I think that's all the code implemented for the basic test of the floppy disk controller. I'll uh, see if that see if that assembles. I'll get any bugs fixed and then burn it onto a netprom, and we'll see how it goes. So I've taken the circuit that we built before, and I've wired that up to both the 6502 computer and to the floppy disk drive. Over here, these wires are coming from the CPU's data bus. Uh, those are going into the inputs on this D flip flop. Um, I made a mistake in the circuit actually. The upper and lower sides of the transceiver, I got them backwards apart from the 
chip select lines. So I rewired some things there. Uh, over here, these lines come mostly from the uh, from the address bus, but there's also the clock in there as well, I think. Um, and on this side, the read write line. And the CPU's reset line is this blue wire here that's that's joining onto the reset pin of the uh, D flip flops for the outputs. The floppy drive signals are coming in here. So these are things like the drive select, the uh, motor on line. Um, I think there's the direction and the step lines in some order there. And over here are the inputs to this circuit, uh, which include whether it's on track zero um, and a couple of other things that I don't use. So yeah, they, that's all hooked up there. But the floppy drive's ground is also connected and that's, the, that's all the hookup done to the 6502 computer. So I can't find a way to actually show the drive and the uh, video display at the same time. So let's just have a look at the drive. Um, this is the drive head. Uh, so we're hoping to see that move inwards and outwards as the program runs. So we're also hoping for the motor to spin. I'm not sure whether it's going to be visible. There might be something to see over here when that's happening. But as I push the button on the computer, we, we, we in particular expect to see the uh, drive head step four tracks inwards and then four tracks outwards again and then 39 tracks inwards, then 39 tracks outwards, back to the outside edge. Um, and then finally it's going to step single tracks at a time uh, for, for a while, and then go back out again or something like that. I can't remember exactly what the code did in the end. So let's let it run and see how it goes. So that's the first button press, that started the motor. That was the next button press and the head moved in. Oh, now the head's moved out again. It wasn't actually on, on track zero at the start, so that, that worked quite nicely. It's gone all the way out and it's found track zero right at the edge of the disk. So now it should go all the way back in again. And then back out to track zero. And then it should go one step at, one track at a time now for a while. So that's working nicely. And there you can see what's shown on the screen while it's doing it. You can see uh, I added a track counter to it, in fact, so that's counting up through the tracks as it steps across the disk. Um, and it shows the flags over here, so it shows when it's on track zero. I can do a couple more commands. I can't remember exactly what it does, it just sort of keeps running through the program if I keep pushing the button. But yeah, that's working really well. It shows that the 6502 has control over the position of the hard, uh, of the floppy disk drive head. Um, it's aware of when the floppy disk drive's on track zero, and um, yeah, it's all it's all looking good for the interfacing. Uh, so I think next time we'll be able to move on to actually reading data from the disk. So I hope to see you then.